Now, why wasn't there anything like it? After all, this was a great uh, mercantile city. Uh, you would have thought that with people coming in to make deals that they would have wanted to, to go to eateries. Now, everyone could eat at home. Well, I think it was um, it was really the – when the Erie Canal opened is when it became a great mercantile city. And before then, it was more, to me, like an overgrown village. And a lot of people did eat at home. And, of course, there were places to get food that were not at home, but they weren't what I would call a restaurant, a restaurant being a place you can go to at a time of your choosing and and look at a menu and have someone serve you. There were sort of cafeteria-style places called ordinaries where they would kind of throw the food at you and it was you didn't have a choice and it was set price, set menu. Uh, there were a few hotels in New York. You could get food there. There were these awful boarding houses about which we know quite a bit be thanks to an enterprising uh, English journalist who left a book called The Physiology of New York Boarding Houses, which got reprinted recently. I was shocked to see. Uh, but most of the wealthy ate at home and had servants cooking for them, and poor people prepared their own food. Right. And for a while there, you could walk home. You could live close enough, as as in most American cities, you people lived close enough to where they worked that they just went home for lunch. Uh, weren't most of the, the places that you could eat segregated by sex? Yes, and, and and that that lasted for a long time. I can remember in the earliest years of my life when some places would have a sign in the window saying "Ladies Welcome." Yeah, it's this was something that was a real problem that um, only got solved by fits and starts. And there were there were exceptions. I mean, there were English diners who would come to New York, and they were shocked to see that, uh, say, at the uh, downtown at the Hotel Lafayette, for example, back in the nineteenth <laughs> century, uh, there was one English visitor who rode home in in great excitement. He said he saw these party of two or three women coming in and, and sitting down at a table, and nobody seemed to notice it. Elsewhere, though, there would be either separate ladies' entrance, separate facilities for ladies, or they just knew that they couldn't find a place to eat. Was that to protect the women, or is it because men didn't want to be bothered? I don't – well, men didn't want to have women around them. It was, a, it was uh, just a Victorian – apartheid along sexual lines and it was it was unfortunate for women because as they uh, it was the same as the no smoking rules which took a really long time to get overturned for women now new york at that time had a lot of ingredients available didn't it first of all it was the oyster center of the world wasn't it absolutely so I mean, is that what most people ate uh well it, it tons of oysters and and the the amazing thing is how close at hand the oysters were i mean they were staten island oysters can you think of anything more frightening but there were those were some of the richest oyster beds for a long time in the 19th century all up and down long island raritan bay in new jersey this was just prime oyster country but it wasn't just oysters if you think of the wetlands of of long island and new jersey which is all industrial now but at one time plover woodcock snipe just the clouds would be sort of dark with these flocks of game birds and they were all on the menu and uh, they could come from the water as well and they they you you say that they came by farm wagon, mm-hmm. canal barge, mm-hmm. oyster boat, uh, and there were even cattle drives from as far away as Ohio. Sure. I mean, you know, the, gradually the cattle drives went farther and farther west, but, you know, there were Pennsylvania cattle drives, which sounds kind of ridiculous. And then they would just barge them across the river. I mean, one of the problems was uh, you know, cattle slipping overboard into the river. And they would uh, push them on into the markets, uh, and the markets were enormous in New York. The Washington Market on the west side and the Fulton Market on the east side uh, were just cities within the city. They were some of the most amazing spectacles of old New York. Well, you say the first one was called the Fly Market on Maiden Lane, and I wonder whether, when, I, when I heard that whether that was a variant on the Flea Market. <laughs> it's, uh, it, the Dutch word means meadow. Fly. fly. Mm V-L-I-E, and it got uh, mushed around to fly. And uh, that was one of the important markets. That was what uh, Fulton Market replaced. And Fulton Market, uh, even food historians don't quite understand this. Fulton Market is not the same as the Fulton Fish Market. The Fulton Fish Market was a little adjunct to the big Fulton Market, and it didn't come along until some 40 years after Fulton Market got up and going. But most of the food there, I assume, was coming by water, by boat. Yes, it was. And so, and since uh, most people lived downtown Manhattan anyway, it was just a walk over to the big market. Uh huh. And once there, you were in 
just one of the most incredible mazes. And it didn't just, there were, of course, food stalls. If you think of some of the grand European markets you might be familiar with that you know, still exist and you go into and there's, you know, 30 cheese dealers and 40 meat dealers. It was like that, except on a, a much larger scale because New York was such a large city. And you could buy almost anything, used books, used clothing. Restaurants sprang up in the Fulton Market. Some of the best markets, uh, some of the best restaurants in the city were, in fact, in Fulton Market, just these little oyster shacks that became more and more glorified as time went on into full-fledged restaurants. And uh, they were all just sort of barnacle-like, these little shacks, and, and outbuildings would get absorbed into the market. 